ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to you. My name is Webster and welcome to this consolidation video class. So this video class is there to uh, compensate or rather to supplement on the blog class that we had last time on consolidations. I think there's a section that I'd said I'll put on video that I couldn't do on class. I hope you had enough time to actually reflect on um, what we did in class and you had time as well to do a number of questions to practice on that. So before you go to the next class, which is the second session of block, block four, or block three, sorry, I need you to make sure that you've watched this video. You've also watched the S28 video and you come prepared for class. So that class we're going to be focusing much on during the arrangements, which is IFRS 11, as well as accounting for investment in associates, which is IS28. So the last time that we looked at consolidations or when we looked at IFRS uh, group, group accounting, we agree that there are two standards which mainly cover the accounting for groups, uh, which is your IFRS 11, as well as, uh, my apologies, IFRS 3, as well as IFRS 10. And if you remember what we talked about on IFRS 3, this is where you'll be required to calculate your goodwill. And there's a journal entry that you need to, um, to, to provide at acquisition date. And then IFRS 10 then covers the rest of the consolidation subsequent to its acquisition date. So when I put a timeline, you then realize that when we are working with journal entries for consolidations, we break down those journal entries into three sections. We have the journal entries which are supposed to be done at acquisition date. Then this is the journal entry which is covered by IFRS 3, and we talked about this in class. But from at acquisition date to the beginning of the current year. We call this the since period. And there are also journal entries that you're supposed to be able to do in the since period, uh, which are mainly covered by IFRS 10. And then you also have got journal entries which are in the current period, which is the period which you'll be reporting for. So before you go for the examinations, it is important that you are able to do journal entries for all the three stages, journal entry at acquisition, journal entry in the since period, and journal entry in the current period. Now, the type of requires that you normally get if they're going to be for journal entries are, when we ask you to do journal entries, we can ask you to do pro forma consolidating journal entries, where we say provide pro forma journal entries at acquisition date. If the question says provide journal entry at acquisition date. What this question will be saying is only provide journal entries which are to the extent of the date of acquisition. You don't need to do anything further. But if the required specifically say it provide journal entries for the year ended. And let's say our year end is that one December 2018. So it says provide, provide pro forma journal entries for the year ended 31 December 2018. What they are saying here, ladies and gentlemen, is we want you to provide journal entries from the acquisition date until the end of this year, which means you provide journal entries for all the three stages that we talked about, at acquisition, in the sense period, as well as in the current period. So that is very important information. It does not matter that the acquisition was done uh, let's say two years, three years back, you always need to provide those journal entries uh, at acquisition date, despite the year of acquisition which took place. So, for example, let's say our acquisition of our company here took place in 2015 on 1 January 2015. So, 1, uh, 1 January 2015 would be the at acquisition journal entry. Then, the beginning of the current year would be 01, 01, 18. So if we are reporting for the 2018 financial period, if they say provide pro forma consolidating journal entries at acquisition date, that means we'll only provide journal entries on 01, 01, 15. But if the required says provide journal entries for the year ended 31 December 2018, despite the fact that we are in 2018 right now, we will still go back to do the first journal entry which would be on 01, 01, 15, which is at acquisition journal entry. So at acquisition, 
then you do second journal entry which would be in the since period which means from 0 01 0 01 15 2 31 12 17 that will be the second set of journal entries that we need to provide then the third set of journal entries that we need to provide will be for the current period which will be from 01 01 18 2 31 12 18 so those will be the three journal entries that will be required to provide in um, in the case that we've asked you to do pro forma consolidating journal entries okay so given that ladies and gentlemen um, i would like now to move to another section which is for which is for the um, the type of journal entries that you actually need to provide um, so i've done an illustration here just to break down those journal entries into those different stages and I will use the steps for, uh, for consolidation. If you're going to do journal entries, what are the steps that you need to provide? So what I have here on the screen are the number of steps which you need to follow through if you get a question which says provide consolidating journal entries. Now, if you remember very well in class, we say that at acquisition date, when an entity acquires another we have got a journal entry that is raised in the separate books uh, in the separate financial statements and we have got journal entries which are supposed to be raised at group level so the journal entries which are raised in the separate financial statements those are the journal entries which are covered by is 27 and the journal entries which are uh, covered at group level those are the journal entries which are covered by IFRS 3 as well as IFRS 10. Now I would like to go back to IS 27 for us to start with IS 27 first. You will remember ladies and gentlemen that we said in IS 27 at acquisition date the journal entry that will be raised would be there will be a debit investment in a subsidiary and there will be a credit of either bank or there will be credit of equity or there will be credit of um, uh, deferred consideration. Uh, so the fair value of deferred consideration or it might actually be a motor vehicle which has been given away and then there is a gain on disposal with this one resembling the carrying amount of that motor vehicle. So this would be the journal entry that would have been done in the separate financial statements. But if you remember well, we talked about IS 27 paragraph 10, and we said there are three ways to measure your, um, your investment in the separate books. It might be at costs, or it might be at fair value, or you might be using equity method and you said for CTA we we'll focus on the on the cost model however you see that previously we we'll, you can get past exam past exam papers which has got fair value method which is used and if you also remember we then say it here in IFRS 3 the first thing that you should be able to do is to calculate your goodwill and for you to be able to calculate your goodwill we said your goodwill formula is your investment value at cost plus your NCI less your fair value of identifiable net assets. Then um, don't forget that here there is um, the one relating to previously held the previously held equity the fair value of the previously held but this one we said will cover only when we get to level two okay so once you do this this should be able to give you a figure here which you then call your goodwill but the important fact that i want to reflect here is that your goodwill calculation considers your investment to be at cost whilst if you are applying is 27 paragraph 10 your investment might actually not be at cost your investment might actually be at fair value here. Yeah. Which means the first stage 
in our consolidation process is if your investment is not at fair value, you need to bring your investment back to fair value. So that's step number one that I want to bring over here. So I'll start with that figure, which I then call step number one. So step number one is reversal of fair values on investment in subsidiaries or associate in measurement at fair value according to IFRS 9. And the idea here is to bring back that investment to come back at cost so that your goodwill calculation can be correct at acquisition date. Therefore, you see the journal entry which is here, which is trying to reverse the investment and we debit the mark to market where that favorable adjustment would have gone. And um, this would be in the prior years and then this is the journal entry which had been done in the current year. But however, the concept is on uh, on acquisition date, the first step is to figure out if your investment is at cost and if it's not at cost, you need to bring it back to cost. Then let's jump to step number two, which we have over here. So step number two now are the elimination journal entries. Now this is the step that we expect most of the CTA students to uh, start understanding. So from step number two going forward, this is where we expect your competence levels to be shown. So at this stage, the step two is to eliminate anything which is not supposed to be sitting in the group financial statements. And if I can go back again to give an illustration of what we used in class previously. So you can have a situation where, let's say we want to consolidate company P, which is the parent company, and company S, which is the subsidiary. And we say that what you need to do is you take the P and L of both entities and to take the SFP of both entities. So in the PL you have your revenue, you've got your cost of sales, you've got your other income, you've got your expenses, you've got your finance costs and everything. So you take 100% of P, you take 100% of S, which means the group financial statements are supposed to be sitting with 200%. And you do the same for the SFP where you've got your non-current assets you got your current assets, you have got your current liabilities, you've got your non-current liabilities, you have your equity. Again, you take a hundred percent of each company, P and S. But the challenge which we have is when you look at the non-current asset section of P, it has an investment which is sitting as investment in S, which has been accounted for using IS 27. And also, under the equity section, there is equity which belongs to S, which is here, which have been acquired by P. So if you go, that equity is the one which has been acquired by this guy, which means by the virtue of putting the investment in the group financial statements here and putting the equity of S in the group financial statements here, we would have double counted for one and the same thing. So which means our investment should not be sitting at group level um, in the financial statements of the group and the equity of the subsidiary, since it has been acquired internally, it should also not be sitting in the group financial statements. So the first stage is to eliminate such transactions. And we highlighted this journal entry in class where we said you need to start by debiting, um, you need to start by debiting your share capital so the debit of the share capital then removes that equity. You also need to debit any reserves which were existing at the date that you acquired. You also need to remove um, any investment which might be sitting there because the investment has been double counted. You cannot invest in yourself. Then we also talked about in your calculation for goodwill, you need to do some fair value adjustments to your assets and also if you do not own a hundred percent you need to create NCI but these fair value adjustments that you have done may trigger some tax implications which are there therefore you should assess if there's any deferred tax asset or liability which might be created on day one at acquisition date as a result of the fair value adjustments so this then sums up your consolidation at acquisition journal entry with the balancing figure forming your goodwill or your bargain on pages on that day. Now, moving on, we say that 
your pro forma consolidating journal entries are broken down into three, which is the acquisition journal entry and the since period and the current period. So as of now, we've only looked at, at acquisition journal entry. So let's jump into the since acquisition stage. So the since acquisition stage assumes the fact that this subsidiary has been trading and it has been making some money. Now, if this has been making some money, that means in the period from the since acquisition to the beginning of the current year, there's some profit which has been sitting in the subsidiary, which should also belong to the parent company to the extent of the shareholding that they have. So let's assume that our entity has got an 80% shareholding. If they've got an 80% shareholding at, and we agree that acquisition date was 1 January 2015, that means from 1 January 2015 to 31 December 2017, which is this period that we see over here, there is some money which has been made. And that money has to be consolidated into the group financial statements. And if you remember well, we talked about the parent is the owner of the group. And any money which the parent has, which they say, this is extra money that we've made, which we've retained, should be sitting in retained earnings of the entity. But now here's the challenge. We talked about adding 100% of P and adding 100% of S, which means that if we are, the parent acquired 80% shareholding in a subsidiary, there's also another guy who referred to as NCI previously, who is holding 20%. So by the virtue of adding 100% of P and 100% of S in relation to the retained earnings column, um, the retained earnings row, what this would mean is we now have total retained earnings which is now sitting in the column for the parent company. But of the retained earnings that we've taken of the subsidiary, 20% is not supposed to be sitting in the retained earnings, but rather it's supposed to be sitting in the NCI column. So the step number three that we want to look at is each time that you have got a since acquisition uh, period. In that since acquisition period, you are supposed to allocate the profit which has been made, which belongs to the NCI, <laughs> and you are supposed to remove that profit from the retained earnings, which belongs to the parent, and you allocate it so that it goes to NCI. So in an illustration, let's say that the company has made 200,000 from 1 January 2015 to 31 December 2017. So 200,000 has been made by the subsidiary. Of that 200,000, this 200,000 is going to be sitting in retained in its column. So when we take P and we take S, we we'll add the retained earnings of P and we we'll add 200,000 relating to S. Let's say that P had 300,000, which means in the group financial statements, the retained earnings column for the group is now supposed to show 500. But retained earnings belong to the parent, which means that we have added 20% of the 200 in the 500 figure, which is not supposed to be that way. So ideally, the parent company in their retained earnings should have 300, which belongs to them, plus only 80% of the 200. Whilst the guys for NCI are supposed to, they do not have any share in the parent retained earnings, so they will have a new here, but in the column for the subsidiary, they've got a 20% stake of the 200, which they have over there, which means NCI is supposed to have a, a, a certain portion of uh, the retained earnings. So the journal entry that we now have here is to take out this 20% of the NCI, which has been added when we took 100% of P and 100% of S, and remove it from the retained earnings column and allocate it to the NCI, which means in this case, we then have 20% of 200 being removed from retained earnings and being placed in NCI. The same concept also applies to if we've got any reserves which have increased from the period of acquisition to the period of the current year. So let's say we had a revaluation reserve which was sitting at 200 at acquisition date 
and now the revaluation reserve is now sitting at 300 which means there's an additional 100,000 which has been made by the subsidiary from the since period to the current period. But now, all the column for reserves in the group financial statements belong to the parent entity. So if the subsidiary has made 100,000, which is in the form of reserves in the since, 80% of that 100,000 belong to the parent and 20% of that 100,000 belong to NCI. But we've added 100% of the P into the group, which means at the moment, the 100,000 has not been allocated. It needs to be removed from that reserve. 20% uh, of that needs to be removed from the reserve and it needs to be redistributed to NCI. So we then raise this journal entry here, which would then resemble the 20% of the 100K increase in retained earnings, which has been made by the subsidiary, which we're saying 20% of that should be reflected to sit in the NCI account and not in the reserve account which belongs to the parent company. Then I'd like to jump now to um, intra-group transactions uh, which, which may also take place but maybe before I jump to intra-group transactions let me talk about what then happens in the current. So up to now we have now looked at its acquisition date, we've looked at what should happen in the sense period, and I want us to briefly talk about what should happen in the current period. So I'll just scroll down here uh, to reflect the journal entry which should be in the current period. So if you remember well, we said that in the sense period we've got money which have been made by the subsidiary, which we said that money, all of it has been sitting in the retained earnings Therefore, the retained earnings of the group entity should not reflect a full hundred percent of the subsidiary, but should only reflect to the eight, to the percentage of shareholding which has been made uh, by the parent company. So the same applies when we're in the current period. There's profit which has been made. That profit is not supposed to belong all to the parent company, if the parent company does not own a hundred percent of the subsidiary. So. Let's now say that we are now in the current year and our profit and loss statements reflect that the entity has made a profit of 500,000. Of this profit of 500,000, this is the subsidiary we're talking about. So of this 500,000, we need to attribute this 500,000 to the parent entity and we need to attribute some to NCI. Which is why each time if you go to the P and L of your uh, of your group financial statements, at the uh, at the end of that P and L, you always see an attribution which has been done, which has been done to the parent company and which has been made to NCI. This is to reflect that the profit which has been made is being shared by these two shareholders. Okay, and therefore, coming back to this one, we have made five hundred thousand. Of this 500,000, we need to do an attribution journal entry where we remove the money which has been made in the P&L and we remove it from the, the component which belong to NCI, we remove it from the P&L and we allocate it to NCI so that the remaining amount which will be sitting in the P&L will, uh, will only go to the, to the retained earnings. So in this case, if we, might, if we made 500,000, of this 500,000, we know that the P&L, the moment we close the P&L, it will eventually go to retained earnings. But we know that the retained earnings belongs only to the parent company, which means we do not want the full 500 to end up sitting in the retained earnings because the parent does not have 100% ownership to the 500,000. So what we end up doing is we then say how much belongs to the NCI guy and to say 20% belongs to that NCI guy. So what we need to do now is we need to take out 20% of the 500,000 and allocate it to NCI so that the remaining component which is 80% is the one which we be sitting in the PNR which will then eventually be closed off to the retained earnings. So to be able to achieve that we then raise this journal entry where we say debit NCI PNL to reduce the PNL figure by 20% of that 500k. And then where is that 20% going? It's going to increase 
the NCI. So we then credit it to the NCI. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, these are the journal entries that uh, we expect at a basic level for you to be able to do uh, for your consolidating journal entries, uh, pro forma consolidating journal entries. Okay. Now, I have ignored the fact that the companies in the group might be trading together. So I've got another session, that I, another, another video that is following to this one, which will focus specifically on how do you deal with the intra-group transaction which happen between companies which are at group level where there's a parent and there's a subsidiary relationship. All right. Thank you very much. So let's, um, let's go to the next video. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to uh, part two of the consolidation of video class. So for this time, we want to look at intra-group transactions. I think on the first one, we looked at the journal entries that you're supposed to raise from an acquisition journal entry until you get to the end of this, the, the year that you're reporting for. So we looked at the acquisition, we looked at the since period, we also looked at the current period. So for this one, we want to specifically now focus on when you've got entities which have got uh, transactions which take place within the group. So you need to separate intra-group transactions which take place in a parent subsidiary relationship and intra-group transactions which take place at um, a, 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 an investment in associate level. So when you watch the investment in associate level, it's very important that you do not confuse the table of accounting for intergroup transactions that we have there with the one that we want to discuss in this video class. So when you've got a parent subsidiary relationship, I think from the previous video class, we agreed that you will have a situation where you've got an entity which is a parent and another which is a subsidiary and to add the two together to form the group accounting. And we talked about the addition of a hundred percent of both entities' financials to get to two hundred percent, which is in the group. Now, here's the problem that we want to talk about as of today. Let's assume that you have got parent company which sells inventory of a hundred dollars to S company. So that means P will raise it as sales. And we'll also raise a cost of sale related to that. Let's assume that this will be $80. And then S is going to raise inventory in their books. And obviously, they will then have a decrease in bank relating to the amount of the purchase which has been done. Now, P, uh, sorry, S eventually then sells that inventory to another guy for a hundred and twenty dollars so putting their own uh, markup there which means we're going to have sales again here of a hundred and twenty bucks and also the cost of that sale was to the extent of 80 bucks now, we say that you add a hundred percent of P and you add a hundred percent of S to get to the group financials. So we want to look at the sales figure for the group. We're going to add 100 from P. We're going to add 120 for S to arrive at $220 for the group. And we're going to add 80 for P and we're going to add another 100, uh, sorry, the costs, the costs for this guy would be 100. So the cost of sales to the group becomes 180. Now, do you see the challenge which we have here? The group is reflecting that we have got sales of 220, but we don't have sales of 220 because the actual sales that we've had are only the highest to the extent of 120. But the fact that we are double counting for one inventory and we're counting for it being sold twice make us have sales which have been double counted. So our true sales 
are the cells which take place to the external party outside the, the group, which means our true cells in this case are not uh, 220, but our true cells are supposed to be 120, which is the cell which took place to the outsider. And the cost to the group, for us to obtain these inventories, our cost was not 180. Our costs are the costs which the group incurred in order for the inventory to get into the group entity. So the inventory got into the group through P, which means the costs of 80 becomes our true cost of the inventory which has been sold. Therefore, our cost of sales again would not be 180, but rather our true cost would be $80, which means in the group financial statements, what we expect is to see sales of only um, 120 and cost of sales only of 80 for those inventories. So we have got an overstatement of sales. We've got an overstatement of cost of sales. This is what happens when we have got inventories, uh, so when we've got transactions which happen uh, in intra-group. Okay. So you end up having double, count, uh, double accounting of the same transaction. The second challenge which we have when we've got inter-group sales is, let's assume that the sales which, take pla which took place of these inventories to S only took place, but S was not able to then subsequently sell that inventory outside the group. So when you look at that now, we get to a situation where we say we've got inventory which has been sold by P to S and P ended up realizing um, a profit of that sell of 20 bucks. But this $20, has this $20 been realized when you look at the group level? So as long as the inventory is still within the group, then we then say that profit which we, uh, we, which, which, which we accounted for has not been realized, therefore it is not true profit. You cannot distribute this $20 as a dividend because that $20 has not been made. The infantry was there in the group before, the infantry is still in the group, there's not been any sales, there's not been any money. So the second challenge which we are bringing through here is each time that we've got intergroup transactions and what has been sold within the group is still within the group, we then have a situation of an unrealized profit which needs to be eliminated. Therefore, I want to focus on the elimination journal entries that we need to do each time we've got intergroup transactions. But what I'll do is I'll separate the transactions into two. You've got intra-group transactions which are for sale of inventory. You also have intergroup transactions which are for sale of PPE. So I will start with the inventory and then once we finish off on the inventory, I'll move on to the PPE section. So let's start with the inventory. So we agree that you have got sales which took place from P to S and then sales again which took place from S going to um, going to the outsider so the first thing that i want us to go back to is we agree that the true cells are supposed to be the cells of the to the external which means the 120 in this case let me just change uh, the the color so in this case the true cells would be the cells of 120 which means the cells of 100 which are over here are supposed to be eliminated and if you remember well again we say that the costs of cells are the costs to which the entity uh, the goods came into the group originally at which are of 80 which means the other cost of cells of 100 here are also not true so the first journal entry that we need, we need to raise is a journal entry where we eliminate the cells and we eliminate the cost of cells. And if you closely look at this, you realize that the figure that we're eliminating will be exactly the same. 
So the first step is to say, to eliminate the cells, we need to debit those cells. So we're going to debit that $100 over here. And we need to credit the cost of sales and we'll credit that $100 over there. So by doing this, we have achieved the first stage of eliminating the sales which have been double counted and the cost of sales which have been double counted. Which means at this stage, we are now left with the true, true, true sales which are of $120, uh, dollars, which are... Um, which are these ones, and we are left with the true cost of sales of 80, which is that one, okay. So that is step number one. Then, if the inventory has not been sold outside the group, or there is a component of that inventory which has not been sold outside the group, what it means is that inventory that we brought through has been overstated. So if I come here, it means that when you look at our inventory, the true value of our inventory was $80 before. But at the moment, our inventory is now sitting at 100 because when we brought it into the box, we brought it at 100 which is the amount at which they were purchased for by S. So if we still have any inventory which would be existing at the end of the year, that inventory would have been overstated by the markup which has been placed by P. So at the end of the year, we need to drop down that inventory. So that inventory has been overstated in value. So we need to drop it down. So I'll jump to the journal entry that we raise for elimination of overpriced inventory. So this is the journal entry that we are going to have over here. So what you do is you calculate the value of the profit which has been loaded in the inventory which has not been sold as yet at the end of the year and what you do is you credit that inventory by that value to reduce that inventory by the unrealized profit so that the inventory will be reflected at the original cost at which they got into into the group and then the corresponding journal entry that you raise is a cost of sales journal entry okay so this is the journal entry that you need to do now for removing of unrealized profit, which means when you've got intergroup sales of inventory and we've got that inventory sitting at the end of the year, ladies and gentlemen, you've got uh, two journal entries that you need to raise, which is the first journal entry being the journal entry for elimination of the sale and the second journal entry, which is elimination of the unrealized profit. But since we are saying that the profit which has been unrealized was sitting in the profit and we need to remove it. The profit, that same profit we're talking about, has got a tax expense which had been charged on it. So the fact that we are now removing that profit from our books from the group financial statements also means that we need to remove the related taxation which accompanies that profit which we are trying to remove. So each time you've got a journal entry of an unrealized profit that you are that you're removing or that you're eliminating, you also need to raise a third journal entry, which is to reduce the tax. So we then credit the tax expense and we debit the deferred tax. Okay. So that's the next journal entry that we need to do each time we've got an unrealized profit component which has been included. So this is in relation to when you have got a sell of inventory which is intergroup okay now I want to look at this is where you've got the intergroup transaction taking place in the current year but what if it actually happened in the since period so what journal entry then do I need to raise because if it happened in the since period what it means is I'm not allowed to touch uh, these sections let me just highlight them I'm not allowed to touch P and L. I'm not allowed to touch P and L. And so in that case, what do you do with the unrealized profit component? So what we need to do now is, if this happened in the prior year, when we account, when we do the pro forma journal entries for the since period, the 
intra-group transactions in the since period will now be replaced by all the things which went to the P&L will now be replaced by retained earnings. In other words, what it means is instead of debiting the cost of sales, it now becomes debit retained earnings. And instead of crediting the tax expense, it then becomes credit retained earnings because all the P&L would have been glossed to the retained earnings. So you cannot have an unrealized profit journal entry with the cost of sale and the tax expense in the sense period. However, all the SFP line items will still remain in the SFP, so those ones you will not have any, any issues with regards to those. So your inventory line item and your deferred tax line item will not be affected in any way. So the journal entry that we would expect you to provide as a result is something which looks like this. So this would be your journal entry for an unrealized profit which took place in the since period. So this is in the uh, in the since period. Okay. Um, pardon for my handwriting over there. Okay. So like I was saying before, you then see that we have closed all the PL to the retained earnings. However, our deferred tax our, and our inventory still remain there. So that is the journal entry for intra-group transaction of a sale of um, inventory. Now I want to look at one which is for sale of PPE. So when we've got sale of PPE, it can happen either uh, on what we call downstream or what we call upstream. I'll explain the two. So downstream is when you're selling inventory, oh, sorry, when you, when you sell from the parent going down to the subsidiary. Whilst upstream is when you're selling from the subsidiary going to the parent, okay? So um, I'll focus on an example here where the PPE which is being sold has been sold downstream. So in that case, if it has been sold downstream, that means the parent is the one which made the profit. And the subsidiary is the one which is sitting with the PPE now. But obviously, when the parent sells, let's say they sold um, equipment which had a value of 500000 But that equipment had a carrying amount in their books of, let's say, 440000 which means the parent would have made a profit or gain on disposal of 60k. This was the carrying amount. This, these were the profits. So, in the books of the parent, PPE had a value of 440. But the problem which is here now is S has now acquired this PPE and they're now putting it at a value of 500k. So, the group now has PPE, which has got a value of 500k. The group also is going to see a disposal profit, which has been made by P, of 60k. And we're going to see that 60k sitting over here. The depreciation, which was there before, was, let's assume that the remaining years were uh, 10 years. So we would have seen depreciation of 44k here. But now what we're going to see now is depreciation of 50k because the asset is now in the subsidiaries books. Which means we're going to see 50k over here. But the concept remember is if you've got PPE, your PPE is supposed to be accounted for using I-16. And if we're using the cost model, I-16 says PPE is supposed to be measured at cost. And the cost which they refer to is the cost in which it originally got into the group at. So by looking at the group 
accounting for this PPE. The group is supposed to account for this PPE at the original costs. But now the group is accounting for this PPE at new costs, which is reflecting the sale which has just taken place. And ideally this is not correct, because when you look at the new cost, the new cost of 500k then results in depreciation being 50k, yet the original cost would have depreciation sit at 44k, which means we've got a number of things which are wrong here. The first thing which is wrong is we've got PPE, which is overstated in the books of the group. We also have depreciation, which is overstated in the group financial statements. So in, in order to resolve that, what we need to do is we need to do elimination journal entries to remove those overstatements which have been done on PPE, as well as those overstatements which have been done on, um, on, on depreciation. And also remember that if the PPE has been sold internally, what it means is we, the parent company has recorded a disposal gain here. But this disposal gain is not real money. There is no value which has been created because the PPE was there in the group before, the PPE is still in the group up to now, which means this profit is actually unrealized when you look at it. Therefore, the journal entries that we then raise are we need to raise a journal entry, which is journal entry number one, to remove that disposal profit because it didn't happen. Then our PPE is overstated. We need to remove, to reduce the PPE. And the overstatement of that PPE is equivalent to that gain on disposal which was spent. So that is the first journal entry that we need to do. The second journal entry is since the gain was going to hit P and R. That gain attracted some tax implications. So we've got a tax expense which is likely to have been raised. But by the virtue that we're now reversing that gain in the P and L, that also means the tax which accompanies that gain on disposal should also go. So to that extent, that means we're supposed to remove the tax expense and also reduce the deferred tax which is related to that sale. Then we also talked about depreciation, that depreciation was overstated. So the next journal entry that we need to do is we need to reduce the depreciation journal entry down, which is by that extra 6k. And that also means our accumulated depreciation had been overstated. But remember that our depreciation is also considered in terms of our calculation of our tax expense and it also affects our deferred tax. So given that the depreciation had been overstated, it had resulted in a lower um, tax expense. But by the virtue of um, reducing our depreciation, that means the tax expense goes up. So the next journal entry is to increase the tax expense and you then also affect your deferred tax um, computation. Okay, so those are the next journal entries that would uh, then happen. So I also wanted just to briefly talk about this one, the intra-group transactions. I, I have not covered the intra-group transactions to uh, go upstream. Uh, the concept is basically the same. And then the difference just here is that when you're now allocating your attribution, you just need to take cognizance of where the profit has been made so that you know exactly how to adjust for your retained earnings being allocated to NCI or your profit for the current year, which will be allocated to NCI. Then um, the last journal entry, uh, intro group journal entry that I've not done, which I also want you to look at. I think it's, it's very basic and straightforward, so I, I know you won't have any challenges. Is the journal entry which is relating to a dividend which would have been declared by the subsidiary uh, going to its shareholders. So the challenge which you then have when you've got such a situation is that the parent company would have received a dividend. So in their books, they would have raised a journal entry which says debit, dividend, um, uh, dividend receivable, it has not yet been received, received so they've got a receivable here. Oh, if they've already received the money, debit bank and they would have uh, credited 
dividend income which they have gone to uh, the P&L. Okay, so it's sitting in the P&L like that. And then um, the subsidiary obviously would have uh, credited shareholders for the dividends um, which is you'll be sitting in the SFP and they would have a dividend declared which uh, will be taken under retained, retained earnings in the statement of changes in equity. Remember this is not an expense to the entity. Okay, um, But this will be 100% because it's going to all shareholders. However, uh, this would be 80%, which is to the extent of the shareholding of the parent. Okay. So this is an intra-group transaction. So you still need to do some eliminations here because what it's saying in this journal entry is that the parent has got some form of income as a result of the dividend. But the group is saying, no, we cannot have uh, income which comes from a dividend that we have declared upon ourselves. So it becomes quite impossible uh, to have that dividend income, which also means that we do not have a receivable or a payable uh, at group level. So we then expect to see uh, a journal entry which will reduce the shareholders for dividends. Uh, we also to see, expect to see a journal entry which would um, uh, remove the, uh, the receivable. Uh, it shouldn't be existing anymore. We also expect to see a journal entry which would be um, for the income here which had been raised so that income needs to go so we expect to see a dividend income um, being being taken away um, also uh, one other thing that we would expect to to, to see is we no longer have uh, this dividend declared which we have over there so expect to see a credit of that dividend um, which they have been declared. And uh, one last thing, we also expect to see the level of NCI um, also changing because NCI has taken a dividend. So NCI should actually reduce by the dividend which has been declared to them. Okay. So this is just um, in a nutshell just to look at the concept which is there. But what I need you to do is now to look at the proper journal entries uh, so that it makes sense to you. I, I think the best thing for you would be to actually take a proper example. I look for your question, we'll do this together. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, in a nutshell, this is um, the, the, the parts that I had not covered adequately in class, which I also want you to be aware of. And uh, the next thing that I actually want you to do is, I need you to do some questions actually. Uh, we need to um, put all of this into practice now, okay? I know that you are also are accustomed to the analysis of equity method. Please take note that the analysis of equity method actually breaks down those three steps that we talked about, the at acquisition since period and current period. But the, it, the analysis of equity is purely a calculation that is simply doing. Um, it does not necessarily transform into the journal entry, you actually need to then do the journal entries uh, from that analysis of equity. So which means it's all good and fine to be able to do an analysis of equity, but I'll still need you to be able to put this down through journal entries, and I also need you to actually prepare financial statements of a group entity. So let's practice on that, and I need you to give me feedback on the next class that we're gonna, uh, we're gonna have together. All right, thank you ladies and gentlemen. Enjoy the rest of your morning, afternoon, or evening.